All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar about bullfrog control at the landscape scale, hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, also known as CCAST. My name is Ariel, and I am a CCAST research specialist with the University of Arizona. I'm based in Tucson, Arizona, on the traditional territory of the Tohono O'odham and Pascuayaki. I will be coordinating a new grassland restoration community of practice, and I also help with other CCAST community of practices like the non-native aquatics and drought adaptation community of practices that we help facilitate. So CCAST launched a webinar series in April of 2020, focusing on the control of non-native aquatic species. These webinars are in support of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. And now I'd like to turn it over to Matt. Awesome. Thank you, Ariel, for that introduction. Uh, I know most of the people on this webinar, I believe, but my name is Matt Graybaugh, and I'm a science coordinator with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Science Applications Program. I also sit here in Tucson. And with Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation, I am a co-director of CCAST. Um, we, a little more about the community of practice really quickly. Uh, we launched the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice in May of 2020 with the aim of facilitating information sharing through webinars, workshops, and the development of decision support tools. And the idea is we are hoping to improve our collective ability to address introduced aquatic species in the West. If you'd like more information on the community of practice or you're not already a member but would like to be, uh, please feel free to contact me directly. And Ariel, if you could put my email address in the chat uh, so folks have it, that would be terrific. Today, we have a presentation from David Hall from the University of Arizona, who will be discussing landscape scale bullfrog control in Southern Arizona. David has been working with, not, with Arizona aquatic reptiles and amphibians for over 40 years and began working on bullfrog removal projects with Phil Rosen and Cecil Schwalbe in 1997. Final reminder here really quickly before I turn it over to David, uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please put those in the chat box and I'll relay them to David afterward to make sure that they get onto the recording. Um, and uh, again, please stay unmuted until the end and turn your video off if you can for recording. Um, with that, I think we're good to go. So David, I will stop sharing and you can begin your presentation. All right, thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, let me get to the screen. All right. So um, yeah, I'm David Hall from the University of Arizona. Uh, started working on bullfrog removal actively in 1997 with Phil Rosen and Cecil Schwabe, as Matt said. Uh, we worked in the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and I just have to tip my hat to both Cecil and Phil. Phil is no longer with us anymore, unfortunately. Um, but they were the ones that, I mean, back in the 90s, people weren't even sure that bullfrogs were causing um, the decimation that they do in southeastern Arizona. And these two were just pushing it through and pushing it through. I mean, a lot of people saw the, um, the evidence, but Phil and Cecil really pushed on it. Um, and I want to thank all these agencies for their support and help in the field, their support monetarily and with uh, pulling cattails and such. Um, as a lot of you know, this is the area in that oval down there at the bottom where I work, where, I've, where we've done the bullfrog removals in southeastern Arizona. Um, this is an area where there are the uh, mountain islands and desert seas. And we specifically are focusing on bullfrog removal for the recovery of the Chiricahua leopard frog. Um, and that's about all the why we're removing bullfrogs I'm going to do. Um, you know, there's a lot of other presentations that show um, songbirds and bullfrogs' mouths and everything, and those pictures are readily available. Um, 
just to, suffice to say that the three major concerns for recovery of the Chiricahua leopard frog in Arizona are habitat destruction, disease, and um, predatory invasive species, which bullfrogs in southeastern Arizona are the major uh, species of concern. Um, so that's my introduction. These, if you're not familiar, these are the habitats that we work in. Probably 99.9% .9 of, well, no, I wouldn't say that. I'd say 90% of the time we work in stock tanks and cattle tanks because they represent the largest aquatic habitats in southeastern Arizona. And then the other 10% uh, of the time we work in uh, lodic habitats or cienegas, streams in the highland grasslands uh, in southeastern Arizona. Uh, we don't work in the desert. Um, there are no saguaros where we work or anything like that. It's all um, upper grassland, transition zone, upper Sonoran life zones, uh, because that's where the Chiricahua leopard frog is. Um, they don't really exist very well below 4,000 feet. So we're, we don't work in the desert per se. Um, The other thing, um, so the next two slides are gonna be the extent of my proof of concept, um, showing that, demonstrating that this works for Chiricahua leopard frog conservation. Um, and then I'm going to get lost in the weeds on the methodology, the budgeting. Um, so if you're really interested in how I do this, that's the rest of the presentation. Um, and if you're not interested in that, well, I would go have an early lunch or a late lunch. Um, so in 2001, this was the extent in southeastern Arizona. This is Tucson over here in that upper left-hand section. This is the Mexican border down here. This is about, I don't know, 100 and some miles wide, 55 miles tall, southeastern Arizona. These are mountains, this is the Chiricahuas, these are the Rincons, um, these are valleys. And this is the bullfrog distribution back in 20, 2001, and the remaining Chiricahua leopard frog populations are in green. And at this point, um, especially like down here, this is what we call recovery unit one uh, in the Chiricahua leopard frog recovery plan, this area right here. Um, bullfrogs had invaded throughout the mountain ranges here and the valley highlands, the grasslands, and were threatening these two remaining holdouts of Chiricahua leopard frogs. In recovery unit two, they'd already spread into the Cienega Creek portion. They invaded all throughout there and eliminated the Chiricahua leopard frog population is there and in the San Rafael Valley, yada, yada, yada. Bullfrogs are bad. That's where they went. Presently, this is the situation. Um, we've successfully removed bullfrogs from recovery unit two, the, nor the northern section of it. And in this southern section of recovery unit one, there was a lot of work done for the recovery of the species down here in the southern southeastern part of um, recovery unit two that mostly involved um, um, habitat reconstruction and translocation. Not a lot of bullfrog um, removal, although there was some, and then there's still some going on. And then over here on the eastern part of the range, um, most of this has been done by translocation and the bullfrogs have been reduced to this one area here. All right, so that's my proof of concept. If you have any more questions, I'll be glad to answer them, but I'm going to move on to how I begin, how I plan, and how I budget for a removal project. So first is choose an area to begin the removal efforts. And this usually means the lowest hanging fruit. And that means mostly forest service land, BLM land, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife land, something that you can have complete or partial complete control over um, so you don't, 
just to get around, now let's see, a better way of saying it to minimize the amount of private land you have to deal with. Uh, private landowners, um, people, some people like their bullfrogs. Uh, bullfrogs didn't get into Arizona on their own. Uh, they were brought here by people and a lot of people still like their bullfrogs. And, and if you're trying to eliminate bullfrogs, that's a problem. <laughs> Duh. So that's the first thing. Second thing is start with a watershed. Um, start with a watershed and then with what we know about bullfrog behavior in Arizona, uh, anecdotally, we know that they travel at least five miles per rainstorm or season, rainy season. And um, we also know that they don't like to go up mountainous inclines. They don't like inclines over 10% generally. They won't storm up them like they will through a valley bottom. So we use those and we define a frog shed. So the frog shed is where the bullfrogs are largely contained on their own. Um, dispersal into the frog shed is limited because of mountain ranges or areas of non-habitat. Um, also, you got to know what bullfrogs do in your area. Um, so drop down, you, you need to know their breeding phenology, you need to know their dispersal phenology, and usually you begin that with the established knowledge base that we have. For bullfrogs, most of that comes from Canada, Missouri, um, you know, where bullfrogs occur naturally, natively, um, and so it, it doesn't necessarily apply to the western area of the United States where growing seasons are longer, activity seasons are longer, um, so, but it's a good thing to begin with. Um, in Arizona, breeding phenology, it's, they breed, they start breeding in April and they don't stop until the end of September. I wouldn't be surprised if during some warm years, they still go into a little bit of October, um, but they will, um, pop out clutches as many times as they can throughout that season. So knowing that helps you approach, um, the removal. The dispersal phenology I've already talked about, they disperse during rains. They really disperse during the monsoon summer rainy season, but they have dispersed in spring rains also. Actually, any significant rainstorm during the year um, might cause them to disperse. And then plan on beginning your work in early spring in southeastern Arizona and target breeding. You want to start in the spring and you want to stop breeding. So that means you need to remove the adults. You need to determine the bullfrog ecology in the area. Um, Google Earth, uh, if you have access to satellite imagery other than Google Earth that's sophisticated, use it. You want to identify every water feature you can and you want to determine whether or not those water features are perennial. If they aren't perennial, when are they full? You just need to just continuously gather as much information on this as possible. Um, and it's best if you're the one that's doing this project, um, you use landowner and manager interviews and, and establish surveys and everything, but you need to ground truth it. You really need to go out there yourself and take a peek on the ground and make sure that um, somebody's not telling you information, you know, inadvertently that's maybe five years old or something. And then you want to classify all these sites as reproductive, non-reproductive, occupied, and unoccupied. Okay, so this is in an ideal world. This is not how I began this. Um, when I began this with Phil and, and Cecil, we didn't know any of this really. I mean, we had some ideas, but this is after 20 years of doing this, this, this is the stuff I like to know before I commit to a project. So that's a lot of information to start out with. And you need money to determine that information. And you also need to identify how to treat each habitat. So using the knowledge, you develop a plan and a budget. 
So in southeastern Arizona, I plan for the project to run for three years, um, regardless of how the big the project area is, um, meaning it doesn't matter if it's uh, within a creek, that's your landscape, or within the frog shed, like I mentioned before. And the reason why I do that is tadpoles take two years to completely metamorphose. So a, a, a bullfrog female will lay a clutch of eggs and then we remove her, but her eggs hatch into the pond and we can't drain the pond. Um, so these, it takes two years for these to completely metamorphose out of the population. So you're stuck with this, ta this tank producing bullfrogs for the next two years. Even though you've removed all the adults, you're stuck with those tadpoles. Even if you say in the entire tank over and over and over, you're not gonna get all the tadpoles. Um, so you're just stuck with that to your timetable. And most likely during a frog shed wide uh, project, you're gonna miss a breeding event. Um, you know, you have limited resources and these bullfrogs just will re reproduce. I mean, that's why they're so invasive in my opinion, you know. Um, in Arizona, they can reproduce continuously and massively. Um, so give yourself an extra year to do uh, tadpole removal and clean up final mop up work. And it allows you to monitor how successful you were in the first two years. So if you did miss a breeding event and you didn't accomplish your goals, you've got a year to plan for the next year to catch up or how many other years you have, you think you have to complete the job. Your overall goal in the first and second years, eliminate breeding, period. Not necessarily all the bullfrogs, but all the adults. If you don't do that, you're never gonna win. Um, you'll just continually spin your wheels. So you wanna maintain the population and juveniles, and until the juveniles exhaust themselves, you know, they, they all don't go through it to adulthood and they disappear. All right. So here's an example of that first stage in planning that I'm talking about. This is a map I generated for um, an area that we got US Fish and Wildlife funding for to work on south of Aravaca in Arizona. It's 140 square miles. In area, there were 77 sites. Um, and we determined where the bullfrogs were, where they bred, where the native frogs were, which are the green uh, sites, the, the wetted areas with no frogs, rounded frogs, the dry areas. We identified these mountains, the urban area, urban area. This is a um, the town of Arabaca, and there's it's this is a developed area, valley, private land. And this is private land owned by a rancher. So with this, you can develop a really well a, a good budget. Okay. Um, this is the kind of ideally information you need to plan on budgeting for a removal effort. How do you estimate the cost? You got to create the budget to, from that map, like I said. It has to be accurate, has to be up to date. And then you develop a second. So you need a budget to obtain that knowledge. That's what I'm trying to say. You need money to go out and do the surveys to make sure that that's true. From there, you develop a second budget based on the known facts. This is the one that, where the rubber meets the road, where you're really starting to remove the project is to remove the bullfrogs from that given area. Um, let's see what am I doing here. Okay, yeah, in this example, it took three years, two full-time crews of two with supporting American conservation experience crews and volunteers. That gives you some idea with the density of habitats that we had on how much you're gonna have to plan for plus transportation, equipment, yada, yada, yada. 
I'm sure there's a lot of questions that are being generated. I hope there are. Anyway, I'm plunging ahead to removal. How do you move? Move. Um, the most basic is hand removal. You can dip net, seine, and you can trap. Hand removal is in the first two days of a site is really effective. After that, all the bullfrogs that are left in a pond are wise. They won't let you get any, anywhere close to them. Uh, unless you like wait maybe a week, two weeks um, for them to forget about you. Um, <laughs> and then you come and surprise them again, but that's not a good timetable. You need to get these guys out of there and you need to get them out of there now because you're racing against them reproducing. Once they lay a clutch, then you're stuck in that two year thing. You wanna stop reproduction. Hand removal, I don't recommend. Um, dip netting, uh, it's a good, a good way to see if there are tadpoles in an area or not, but it's not as effective as seining. We have two types of seines. They're both bag seines. Um, we use one for a sampling. It's a 12 foot long, uh, four foot tall bag seine that's easy to handle with two people. And that tells us what's it's you know you do one or two sayings there and usually get an idea how much how many tadpoles there are in Arizona. And let me just back up a little bit. In southeastern Arizona, when you have a bullfrog population, you have a bullfrog population. I mean, we're talking numbers that for an acre of stock tank that go beyond go into the thirty thousands. And we're talking adults and juveniles. Mostly they're juveniles, of course. And usually the adults are numbered like 50 adults or something like that. These are pretty staggering numbers. And in Arizona, the growth of bullfrogs, when they, it, it seems like in our, in our experience, they hatch, they stay in that uh, 50 millimeter to 70 millimeter um, size clutch for a considerable amount of time, probably three months. And then once, once they're at 90 millimeters, they just grow in, in 10 days, I've seen them grow to 130 millimeters and, they're, and they're, they have egg clutches and they're ready to breed. Um, so if you've got a population with a lot of 90 millimeter bullfrogs in it, you're in trouble, you've got to work hard. Um, if you've got a bunch that are in the 50 to 70 millimeter range, you've got that three month time period usually, but you just got to keep monitoring. Um, okay, I went off on a tangent there. Um, seining is great for getting the tadpole numbers in a, in a pond down to a manageable level. Um, so you're not shooting tens of thousands of juveniles you know, you're shooting hundreds because uh, you don't want them to get that to that 90 millimeter range. Um, trapping is a good, good thing to do in small development ponds where you can't do shooting or the bullfrog is too smart for you to catch. And believe me, I've been outsmarted by a lot of bullfrogs. Um, so we use hoop traps. Um, I think Maddie, Marsh in Arizona uses baited um, hoop traps now, but um, being an old time turtle biologist, I stay away from baited traps as much as I can these days. Okay, so shooting, you can use air rifles or 22 long rifles. We prefer 22 long rifles. We work outside of urban areas. I would avoid urban area work at all possible. I've tried it once. It was a long three-year project. It's urban areas are <laughs> just totally surrounded by lots and lots of people that do lots and lots of things that are out of your control. And it, it's just an untenable pro, um, prospect from my, from my perspective, unless you build a 10 foot fence around it and access the limit. Um, anyway, that's a, another rabbit hole I just went in. Um, air rifles, they're effective. Um, we use 22 caliber polymer um, pellets. Uh, we only use them when we're close to a, a rancher's house or something, and that's the only option we have. Um, 
because the pellets don't always um, kill an adult bullfrog. A 180 millimeter bullfrog is hard to put down with a pellet rifle. Um, we've had them live um, and reproduce. Actually, we found one with, um, okay, so this will be gross. We apparently wounded a bullfrog at a site and we blew half of its head off. It had no eyes. It, we found it, I think it was a month later, mating with another female still with half of its head gone. Um, they're, they're just incredible creatures. Um, I have the utmost respect for bullfrogs. Um, they just don't belong in Arizona. So anyway, we have marksmen trained on 22 long rifles. It puts them down fast, it's effective. They're all scoped. They're um, Ruger 1022s with extended magazines and specialty triggers. Um, and we don't fool around. Uh, when we get into a site, we want to stop those guys getting to 90 millimeters before it's untenable. So, I mean, a lot, a lot of, you know, for a lot of people, that's not um, palatable. 22 rifle use is not palatable for a multitude of reasons that are pretty much self-explanatory. In Southeastern Arizona, we've been successful with it. We've used it for 20 years, um, but we use really highly trained people. Um, and these are people that I like to keep. Um, so that's what you need um, for that. Anyway, draining, draining is the best. Draining solves all your problems in one swoop. Um, it's the preferred choice if you can do it. So like I said before, saning is the most effective method of removing tadpoles. This is a picture of an ACE crew um, that uh, was worked in this large stock tank. Uh, I think over the course of two years, we removed close to 20,000 tadpoles from this tank using this method, which was really helpful. However, saning, usually if you get into a big pond like this in, in Arizona, it's very productive and it's filled with aquatic vegetation. Um, if you get into a situation like that, um, you want to sane in the clear areas, obviously, and not in these heavily vegetated areas. Um, you, you might think you, you can pull it. Well, for those of you that ha haven't had a lot of experience staining in veg, um, try it. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, so we were restricted to staining in these open areas, and then that left us with um, two years of thousands and thousands of tadpoles metamorphosing um, over the year. Let me see. I don't know where I was going with that, but that's that. Firearms, I've talked about that a lot. It requires lots of training. It is time consuming. Um, when we get to the point where we're shooting a lot, that's all the two crews are doing. They're just going from one tank to another tank, to another tank, to another tank, to another tank mopping up. Um, and it's unpleasant for landowners. It's, it's noisy. Um, shooting across water like this one gentleman is doing here in this picture, um, it's, it, it causes ricochets. Um, I've seen ricochets bounce off the water at close to 90 degree angles, which meaning it means anybody over here at uh, two or um, three o'clock or nine and eight o'clock, if you, you know, if the circumference of the tank is a clock and he's at four o'clock, well, they're in danger of being hit by the bullet ricocheting. So you got to make sure there are cattle around. You got to make sure there are no people around. The people that are there spotting um, are behind the gentleman shooting um, or person shooting. And um, and we this is what we do. We use teams of two. One's a spotter with a 10 power, high quality binoculars, spots the bullfrog, and the other person's the shooter with the scoped rifle. The binoculars are 
better for spotting bullfrogs and then the spotter directs the shooter to where the bullfrog is. Um, because at this point, when you're getting the last 5% of bullfrogs out of the pond, they're all really well aware that you're, I mean, you've been coming to this pond all the time and they're, they're hip, they're hip to you, um, except at this range. Um, so anyway, that's part of the firearms. Like I said, draining is the best. And um, these are, you can use um, big pumps like these. This is a six inch diesel powered pump, which is the preferred way to do it because it'll pump a pond this size down in 24 hours to this. And um, that's, you want, you want it done, over. Um, and then you can mop up anything that's left over here. It's begin. It, of course, it's it's best done during the dry season, so it doesn't fill up on you right away. Although I have drained ponds during the rainy seasons, I've drained a pond completely, um, and it does put a hurt on the bullfrog populations. But then two weeks later, it was full again, and of course, we didn't get all of them, so it was like a massive effort that was not as productive as it could have been if we did it in the early spring during the dry season. Um, let's see. Yeah, a lot of these tanks are built over springs. You want to avoid that <laughs> uh, if you can, um, or just be prepared for it, uh, which usually means it'll, it'll never be dry. It'll always have a, a pond at the bottom, no matter how much you pump. So it, it just shrinks your area, and you can just work that area over with hand nets or seines or rifles or whatever is appropriate. It's not a good way to break the ice with landowners. Um, cattle ranchers, um, so I, I haven't really gone into um, the public outreach aspect of this, and that's practically another hour's worth of talk. But um, just briefly, um, when you're introducing yourself to a landowner that you'd like to uh, work on their property, you don't wanna tell a rancher that you wanna drain their tanks, even though you really do. Um, because that'll turn them off quicker than anything. Um, so you want to work with them. Um, a lot of times, even if you've worked with them and you've established a good re relationship, it's too important of a water source for their cattle and they're just not going to let you do it. So there are a lot of reasons why people don't like their tanks drained, especially ranchers. Um, so it's not good to go in there and say, well, we're going to come in and drain all your tanks. That's not a good thing to do. Anyway. And there's veg removal. If you have um, heavy equipment available to you, you want to knock down the cover so your removal techniques can be effective and as efficient as possible. And that means either with backhoes or excavators or with a lot of backs, a lot of, a lot of work. Um, we go out there in this little John boat and um, we, we borrow this um, underwater weed whacker from the state and it get, cuts the uh, tadpoles below the water line. You don't want anything, you want to minimize floating vegetation. You want, you want the bullfrogs to go on the banks if you can, because they're easier to shoot on the banks than in the water. Um, they're harder to see in the water. There's a lot of veg in the water that's just more cover. So you want to clean up the whole thing. It's a lot of work, um, but it's effective. And in some cases, it's the only thing you can do. In fact, most of your work is doing veg removal. And then you want to establish, okay, so you've cleared an area of bullfrogs, but it's not the entire area. So you want to protect what you've achieved. It's kind of bouncing around a little bit, but it all kind of makes sense. These are areas that are in interfaces between the areas where there were bullfrogs and where there still are bullfrogs. And the frog habitats within the buffer zone are surveyed enough um, within a year to prevent bullfrogs from the bullfrog area going into the area that you've cleared of bullfrogs. So it's a buffer zone, um, meaning it's an area that you continually plan on removing bullfrogs from to protect the areas behind it. 
Here's an example of a regional bullfrog removal that was successful and a buffer zone that we established. So this is RU2, Recover Unit 2 in 2010. This is the little town of Sonoida for those familiar with Southeastern Arizona. Um, no, this is Sonoida, I'm sorry. That's Patagonia. Um, in 2010, bullfrogs were in Cienega Creek, they were in the Rain Valley area and they were in the Baba Kamari River and um, the upper portion of um, the Coronado National Forest here. We got a grant 2010, Phil Rosen, Dennis Caldwell, my, myself, Cienega Watershed Project and the BLM got a NIFWF grant. And in three years, we had, okay, so the colors, these are the, these are the um, Chiricahua leopard frog populations that were extant then. And then in 2013, we had, we had Remove the bullfrogs from the creek and um, from the upper areas of green of the uh, Rain Valley area, and translocated some frogs to um, some habitats that were constructed, and they also uh, naturally colonized the creek on their own. And so, let, let me go back to this map for a second. A lot of this. Because the bullfrogs were in this area, it prevented the BLM from doing any real conservation for bullfrog or for Chiricahua leopard frogs in this area. And that's how they kept this line here. They just refused to allow the rancher to keep permanent ponds in this area. They refused anyone to build a permanent pond in this area. This spot here is a natural spring run. These are all natural populate, well, semi-natural populations in the um, Santa Rita Mountains, they weren't considered to be an eminent threat from bullfrogs. For one thing, bullfrogs don't like mountains. They just don't um, for a variety of reasons. They get flushed out of mountain stream se um, sections. Um, they like ponds. They like the slow Cienega streams. Anyway, so that's how that line was kind of maintained. These are urban, are not, this is a developed area, a community, a rural community that has a lot of water features. Okay, so three years later, um, we removed the bullfrogs. The frogs naturally colonized this area. We translocated frogs here, and we protected this from this, the um, bullfrog populations from the south by establishing this yellow buffer zone area, which meant that we at least twice a year monitored all the stock tanks and water features in this area to prevent any bullfrogs that came up from the south into this area from establishing themselves and colonizing the, uh, the habitats that were in the established Chiricauensis, uh, Chiricau leopard frog sites. That's a buffer zone. And then we didn't do any more translocations, but the, the Chiricahua leopard frog populations did so well and flourished that they colonized a lot of the areas up here on their own. We, um, we have marked frogs that traveled 10 miles uh, within, uh, don't hold my feet to the fire in this, but I think it was over a, over a one year period. I don't know, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's in, it's in a report that CCAST has that we wrote up. Um, and we, we started to work on these bullfrog populations here along with the state. Arizona Game and Fish has been extremely helpful in this effort here to expand this bullfrog buffer zone. Um, in fact, they're practically the ones that are pioneering this right now. Um, and this is probably the most successful of the three uh, bullfrog removal efforts that we've done. Um, it's just a real example of how to do uh, Chiricahua leopard frog conservation so that the frogs expand into a metapopulation and are able to maintain themselves. This, you know, they've been doing this for almost 10 years now um, with very little help from us. I mean, we do monitor all these populations, but there's no more bullfrog removal done in this area. 
it's all done here when it occurs. Also, um, the Forest Service is actively uh, doing bullfrog removal and um, habitat restoration in this area. Anyway, that's my talk. It was exactly 40 minutes. Wow. Uh, these are the people that helped us on all that, and I'm ready for questions. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, do have a bunch of questions coming in that we'll try to get through and feel free to keep those coming in um, and I'll try to keep on top of it. Great, yeah, 40 minutes, perfect, David. All right, um, so a series of questions here. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in about the use of chemical treatment as well. Um, and a question from Jimmy, who I think Jimmy, uh, I believe you said in Utah, the question was, um, or he said, so no rotenone rotin or uh, per magnate for use use for larvae in Arizona? Does it depend on the landowner? Um, have you tried chemical removal for or chemical control? No, we haven't. Um, for the most part, um, wrote known use and and then it's um, counteracting agent, the potassium permanganate, um, isn't used in Arizona right now. Um, there was a big scare a few years ago. Um, about its use causing oh, Parkinson's disease or something. And so we were told we couldn't use it from the get-go. Um, that might have changed in the last few day, days. Um, and yeah, okay, so it's a pesticide. So um, yeah, uh, we just don't use it uh, because it's not available to us, to the best of my knowledge. We would gladly use it if we could. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, David. Um, so we had a couple questions here on shooting as well. Um, the first question was, uh, have, why don't you use shotguns with non-lead shot for uh, bullfrogs and why use 22s? And I, looking at your photos, I was wondering if it was a range issue or if, or if there was another, another reason. Um, there are people that have tried using shotguns. Um, let me go back a little bit and and if we don't use lead ammo in the 22s we use it's either a copper polymer uh, mix or it's a tin alloy mix with no lead in it um, they're really good rounds they're expensive though um, compared to the lead rounds but we don't use lead rounds and also in arizona lead in the water is not an issue because the waters are basic um, they're not um, acidic, so the lead doesn't readily dissolve into the water, but we don't use lead anyway. Shotguns are inefficient, believe it or not. Um, they just don't work as well as, um, as 22 long rifles. It seems like they work, but they don't. Um, you'll be on a bank and there'll be oh, thousands of juveniles basking in the bank and you'll shoot a couple of 12 gauge uh, steel um, bird shot at them and you might get five. Uh, you might get 10, but by the time you're done shooting at them with a 12 gauge shotgun, your shoulder is hamburger. Um, it's just not, it's, it's believe me, it's just not a good, efficient way. Shotgun rounds are really expensive, um, 22s. 22s. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, and now we've had a couple questions come in on um, timing or, uh, yeah, uh, when you would prioritize shooting. So I think from Mike Van Haddam, um, do you have a diurnal emphasis on shooting? Are you shooting early morning, evening hours? Um, can you break down kind of what you, well, what time of day or night you would prioritize and uh, what works, what's worked for you? That's, that's a great question. Um, a lot of our work is done at night. Um, so some of the some of the stock tanks that we encounter just have these enormous densities of bullfrogs. And there's no difference between day and night then in terms of your effectiveness in, in shooting. Um, but there are always going to be more frogs out at night than there are during the day. Or you'll always be able to see more frogs at night than you will be during the day. Um, we use really powerful flashlights. Um, 
uh, the model we use is an Olight Javelot J22, I think, or something. And it has an incredibly tight beam and it can throw it for just hundreds of meters. And um, that's how we're most effective using the spotter and the with a flashlight and binoculars and um, shoot. Um, so we use both day and night, but nighttime is the most effective to put it short and bluntly. Thank you, David. Um, questions still rolling in here. Um, where do I want to go next? Let's go ahead and do this first. Um, could you describe any differences in your approach to eradication at cattle tanks versus perennial stream settings? Yeah, great question. Uh, the perennial streams, um, you can't, you know, a lot of, in, in southeastern Arizona, these perennial stream sites are often sites for other endangered species, um, bird nesting sites, um, garter snakes. So you can't go in there usually and do the veg removal that you want. Um, so you have to, but the streams are small. They're usually slot pool streams, meaning they have enormously deep, steep sided pools. And um, so they don't have vegetation growing in the center necessarily. So we've used canoes in the most ridiculous place. We've used kayaks in the most ridiculous place, you know, where we have to hike these canoes and kayaks into pools that are basically 10 meters long and four meters wide. But the only way we can get in there and effectively shoot is to float them in there. And then you scare the frogs. So you have to wait in this pool for an hour or two for them to recover. And then um, you have about yeah, an hour's worth of work before it becomes inefficient. And then you go home till the next night. And you know it's shampoo, rinse, repeat. Uh, bank shooting is often effective where, where you can. Um, a lot of times in these stream places, you can get away with these um, scuba diving um, or, what do you call those? Harpoons or whatever. Um, right. And with gigs. Um, but for the long term, that's just, we just, to be really honest with you, I don't even fool around with that stuff anymore. I mean, we just go in there. We're, we usually go for big projects. We're time constrained. We just want to go in, hit it while the bullfrogs are active, move on to the next place. And that's why we use 22s so much. Um, they're super effective. <clears throat> uh, gigging is probably the least effective, in my opinion, um, but it's a, it, it can be fun. Uh, so anyway. So thank you. Um, that sounds more complicated. Um, let's see, where do we go, want to go next? Um, so a couple questions related to draining of, of tanks as well. Um, so this question is, what do you think about the timing of draining areas for which you have more of a breeding pulse relative, a breeding pulse relative to a continuous breeding cycle? Um, so draining seems to target aquatic life stages, but not adult life stages, or is that incorrect? Um, no, it's, it's targeted at all life stages. Um, it's basically just removing the habitat for a short period of time and destroying every, every aquatic thing in there. Um, it's the nuclear option, I guess. Um, okay. That's the way I use it. Okay, fair enough. All right. Um, related to draining here again. So there's a question on if you've tried using silt fencing around the pond before train before draining to prevent dispersal. And there was an example from Ryan where they've tried it in Colorado. Uh, it seems to help. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it works. Um, we did that at Buenos Aires, uh, Phil Rosen and um, I can't remember his crew in the early aughts. They fenced the pond, they drained it, and um, that's how they contained the juveniles in there. And they basically, you know, let the juveniles dry. Um, that works. 
it's an awful lot of work um, and the fences have to be monitored. In that instance, um, it was one pond in one area and that's all they wanted to deal with. Okay, so that worked. In my instances with 77 sites that I have to take care of, I don't have time to do that. Um, if I did, if I had a huge crew, I could, sure. If you had a huge crew, you could do that and build off that. that that'd be something to think about, if, um, but it's not something I've pursued. Also fencing, my experience with fences is that unless they're 10 foot tall and they have no trees around them, they fail, period, for bullfrogs. Um, that's in my experience, maybe eight feet tall. <laughs> a six foot high fence, they'll go over. All right, thank you for that. Um, okay, I think we'll deal with this policy question next. So uh, for, for work on cattle tanks on BLM or fur service property, are you covered under some sort of programmatic NEPA or do you have to get project by project categorical exclusions um, or FONSIs or how do you deal with the permit inside? Yeah, that's a good issue. Um, in Arizona, we're largely dealing with the um, widespread forest um, grazing, what do they call that? I don't know, they've been working on it for a long time. But it's by, the forest has it so that we can go in there and work without a site-by-site -site permit. And so does the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Okay. Actually, there might be some forest people here that can chirp in. Yeah, feel free. Um, I know we have a bunch of Forest Service folks. Feel free to drop that in the chat if you'd like to. Got a couple of the questions and we're getting close on time here. So let's oh, see. As far as, as, let me say, as far as pumping out, yeah, that's, that's a whole different, that involves the management agencies and the grazing agencies and everything. It, it's not as easy as me going up to the rancher and saying, hey, I want to pump this out. And the rancher going, oh yeah, sure, no problem. No, you got to. Yeah, you got to coordinate with the agencies. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, I think there's a quick question here, and I just can't recall. Um, so, David, you mentioned the five mile dispersal um, radius, if you will, for bullfrogs. Is that documented in the report as well? I can't remember where we uh, where we've seen that. That's been documented in a um, a master's thesis by Dennis Saray completed, I believe, in 2010, and it's it's hard to get a hold of. I knew Dennis when he was working on that work, and so he told me about it, and my subsequent anecdotal experience with bullfrogs kind of confirming it. It's a good rule of thumb to think of all the time. Um, it doesn't, you know, mountain ranges are going to be a barrier, but it, they're not 100% effective. They're kind of a filter. If you have a huge population next to a, um, you know, a, a grade that's over 10%, some of those juveniles are going to book and boogie over that range. Um, not as many as that will go down um, the, the Bajada into the into the valley bottom. But uh, it's a it's a good it's a good thing to count on. We use it a lot in building our uh, buffer zones and such topography. That, I hope that answers the question. That's good. Thank you. Okay, looking here. Um, and one thing I'll, th oh, I'll talk about this in a minute. It's I don't remember if we have a link to the master's thesis in the case study application, but that's something we can follow up and check on. And Heather, we can help connect you with that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, I don't want to put them on the spot. We can talk about that later. Yeah. So, thank you, David. Um, so I'm trying to see if there's anything else I definitely want to cover here. Um, maybe let's wrap it up just quickly with your experience on impacts of these frogs on native species. So there's a question in here of if you've conducted stomach content analysis. I know there are tons of folks on the call that have probably looked at you know what these frogs are eating in the landscape. So if you want to talk about that just for a minute, and then we'll have uh, some final comments here. Yeah, um, that's. It's a great question and it's real simple in southeastern Arizona. If you have a bullfrog infestation in a, in, a, in a cattle tank, 
like we've been talking about, you will you'll have you won't have any random frogs. Period. Um, the frogs that utilize the waters on a temporary basis, on a seasonal basis, like toads and such, um, they'll still be able to go in there, and then they're usually their um, reproductive potential overwhelms the um, bullfrog predation pressure on that. So frogs like uh, uh, Cognatus um, and um, uh, Alvarius, there's no hit on them necessarily. I have noticed that um, the narrow mouth frogs, there seems to be a, a, a serious hit on them. On garter snakes, there's just a serious hit on all garter snakes with bullfrogs. Um, generally, other than the toads, that's what you'll see in a pond with a bullfrog um, infestation. It's just bullfrogs. Oh, and uh, yeah, we've done we've done a lot of stomach content um, examinations, and when there's a high population of uh, juvenile bullfrogs, that's what you'll find in the bull the adult bullfrog stomachs mostly. And then when they go down, it's like water beetles and uh, cybisters and, and uh, bellistomatids and stuff like that. Turtles, snakes, trick out leopard frogs. Um, one thing I didn't address is you will run into sometimes a case where you have bullfrogs that are establishing themselves in a stock tank along with the native frog that you're wanting to save. And that creates um, a lot of work. Um, we it, it's just it's it, there's going to be some tape i'll put it that way so plan on that awesome thank you david so uh we're approaching the top of the hour here i want to go ahead and wrap it up on time in respect of everybody's time um you'll see in the chat that ariel put in a few different hyperlinks to uh case study related material on uh ccast a link to this individual case study with some of the resources that we talked about a little bit. And we'll add this webinar recording to the resources tab there within the next couple of weeks, as well as links to the uh, YouTube channel and the main CCAST page. So feel free to explore that and reach out to any of us, uh, myself, Ariel, or others associated with CCAST if you have questions. Um, so a few closing remarks here. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us. Thank you, David. Um, we've been wanting to do this for a while. It's great to get, you know, all your experience on display here and shared with folks. I really appreciate you taking the time to prepare and visit with us today. Um, Thanks. As we, okay, awesome. Um, and we are recording the webinar. It'll take us a few days to trim it, clean it up, get it up on the YouTube channel, but we'll get that up within a week or so and share that out with folks that are members of the community practice. Uh, there's a link um, that Ariel put in there for the YouTube channel, and it'll also show up if you just do a Google search for CCAST YouTube. Uh, we are hosting a second webinar this month on March 25th, um, which is a little different. Uh, Jill Wick from the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish is going to be talking about non-native trout removal in western New Mexico, I believe, and that will be in support of Gila trout recovery. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, but want to make sure you get these invites, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us directly. Uh, those of you that are already members of the community of practice, you know you're receiving those emails, uh, but if not, um, feel free to reach out. And with that, I think that's all I have. It's just final thanks for your time. Thanks again, David, for the presentation, and we hope everybody has a great Thursday and Friday and a great weekend. Bye.